uh, that we're surrounded, you know, we're going to lose our lives. And, and Elijah prayed and, and, and prayed that God would open up the servant's eyes. And when the servant went outside and looked, and there on the hillside surrounding them were the armies of God. <laughs> Aren't you glad of that? That we have a Lord that, cares, that, is, that loves us and that is concerned about every area of our lives and is there always at the right moment. He's never late, is he? He is always there in the nick of time. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we move on. This coming Wednesday is Wednesday. No, it is prayer night. And uh, so there's just one prayer time at 6 o'clock. And so I want to encourage all of you uh, to be there. It's an hour from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, and we pray. That's what we do. And so I think if there's anything missing in the church at large, it's prayer. The Bible says the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and they are effective. And so we're going to call down the power on Wednesday. So be there at 6 o'clock. Uh, next week is Palm Sunday, and so we're going to take a little bit of a break from Revelation. After this morning, you're going to see why. And uh, next week we'll be talking about uh, Palms of Victory. And then, of course, the Sunday after that is what? It's Easter, uh, Resurrection Sunday, and so beginning at 7 o'clock down there on the point, uh, we are going to have our sunrise service, always an awesome time. Uh, the sun comes up right at where the, the, the gap is, is, where Smith Mountain comes in, and it's just an unbelievable sight, and so we'll be out there um, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then we're coming back here at 8.30 for an awesome breakfast. And then our service is going to be at 10 o'clock, not at 11 o'clock. And so we're foregoing our Bible classes at 9.30, and so our service will be at 10. Uh, the choir will be, be presenting the love of Jesus, and then I'll be closing out with a, a short devotional. So it's going to be an awesome, awesome morning. Uh, I have 14 people coming. Okay, and I want you all to match that, okay? We've got plenty of chairs in the back, but I want you to bring someone. Uh, maybe there's someone that you haven't seen out for uh, a while. Uh, invite them to come out, even if they haven't been to church before. Uh, they tell us that Easter and Christmas time or will be the, those times of the year when people will say yes if you invite them to church. And so do it. Just invite them. Uh, if they can make it for the sunrise service, great. I'm sure they'll want to come to the breakfast and then immediately following here uh, for the service, for the love of Jesus. And it's just going to be an awesome morning. I love, listen, it's been a couple of years uh, because of the pandemic and all that's going on since we've had uh, a packed auditorium. Let's do it on Easter, right? Bring them in and let them hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the gospel message will be made plain and simple and will give everyone an opportunity to respond to that. And so bring them out Easter Sunday. Anyway, that's the schedule coming up. Uh, the men's ministry on Friday. We had 36 guys here a Friday morning. It was awesome. Yeah, give them a hand. Uh, Mike did an awesome job. Vince was there to help cook. Uh, Johnny was invited his friends. And I'll tell you what. Having friends like them, I wouldn't want to be enemies to them. And so it was just a great, great, great morning. And so probably the first Friday of every month, we're going to be gathering together as men. And it'll be something different each time. And it was a time of fellowship. It was a great breakfast. And so great job, guys. And it showed in the guys that were there. We had many visitors. And so it was an awesome morning. May 6th, that's the day after my wife's birthday. Okay, good. All right, I'll remember that. And so we'll let you in on the details of that when we get closer. That May 6th, 730, right? Yes, Food will be good. Always is. Be good. Always <laughs> is. <laughs> Very good. Patsy. Oh, Patsy, yeah. You know what? I told Patsy I was a little disappointed in her because usually every April Fool's I get a phone call. And it's something I did wrong. Last week, I mean, she said, there was people on the roof taking all the shingles off. And I'm thinking, no, there's not. I'm right here. There's nobody there. And, <laughs> and so usually, <laughs> usually every uh, um, April Fool's Day, I get a call. But I didn't get one this year. And so I think you threatened her, did you not? 
You threatened her. No, nothing on this particular day because of the man. She fixed sausage and gravy, and it was just an awesome, awesome morning. And so thanks, guys. A job well done. Uh, we're in Revelation 17 uh, this morning, and so if you have your Bibles, uh, I want you to take your Bibles out, and if you have a pen, I want you to take a pen out, because we get into this particular chapter with a lot of imagery, uh, a lot of things that if we take literally, uh, it does not make sense. And so you remember, uh, we said at the beginning here in, in our study in Revelation that we will always interpret literally, but if we come to a passage of Scripture in which the literal does not make sense, then there has to be a spiritual meaning to that. And so chapter 17 and chapter 18 give us a lot of imagery which if we take literally just does not make any sense, and so there has to be meaning behind it. And so usually when we do that, when we look after the meaning, we will use other passages of Scripture in the Bible to support what we believe that to be. And so this is what we're going to be doing uh, this morning. And so I doubt that we're going to, you know what, my shoelace is untied, so you don't mind if I chew, uh, tie it, right? I already missed two th- songs this morning, so I think I get three mistakes, right? Three strikes, you're out. Okay. (laughs) All right, we're in chapter 17. Chapter 17 this morning. And again, uh, in in chapter 16 last week, you remember, uh, now we're in the last three and a half years, of this seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. I don't want to remind you that this is already written down. What we have been studying and will continue to study till the end of Revelation 22 is what is going to be happening in the future. I call it future history because it was already written down 2,000 years ago as John received it from Jesus, but there are events that have not happened yet. And so I call it future history. And so we're now in this last three and a half years of the seven-year period before the second return of Jesus Christ. You remember Satan is already on earth. Uh, We have the satanic trinity, Satan himself, the antichrist, and the false prophet now that are wreaking havoc on the earth against the nation of Israel and against the believing church that rises up during that time, probably not rising up in the open, but probably will be underground. And so we saw last week in chapter 16 where not only do we see and the earth is experiencing the wrath of Satan, but we're now going to see the wrath of God that is being poured out. You remember John's attention is drawn to the temple, not on earth, but the temple in heaven, and there is a voice then that comes from the temple and announces seven angels that will come forward that have seven vials or seven bowls, and the voice then tells the angels to pour out what you have in your hand on the earth. And as each bowl or vial is poured out, there are a series of events that will happen on earth, one in succession, one built upon the other. And so we looked at these bowls last week in chapter 16. You remember the voice goes out and pours bowl number one, and and when that happens, the angel pours out the bowl on the earth, and as a result, uh, unsaved mankind, the kingdom of Antichrist, every individual then breaks out and soars uh, all over their body from their heads uh, into their toes. And so this bowl affects unsaved mankind. If you have the mark of Jesus Christ during this time, this particular bold judgment does not affect you. You remember during this time you have the kingdom of the Antichrist, unsaved, who have received the mark of the beast, but you also have believers that have risen up during this time as well. Many, perhaps tens of millions, will be martyred for their faith, but there will be many who are still alive during this cataclysmic time. 
The voice then tells the second angel to pour out their bowl on the, on the sea. And you remember when the bowl is poured out, uh, the sea then turns the blood and every living thing in the sea then dies as a result of the sea turning into blood. And so now you have people, the unsaved people now that have the sores all over their body, but now you have the stench coming from uh, sea life that, that has been uh, killed as a result of sea being turned into blood. The voice goes out on the third angel to pour out its bowl, and, and so when the bowl is poured out, then it affects this, the rivers and the springs. In other words, all fresh water then is also turned to blood, and so the only water available would be perhaps bottled water. How many of you drink bottled water? I mean, they're everywhere, right? They are, we have some right here this morning. And so perhaps maybe the only thing left fresh to drink or bottled water that perhaps, or perhaps believers who have read the scriptures who realize that, hey, there's a plague coming, we better stock up on, on, on fresh water. And I'm sure those bottles will not be 50 cents. How much do you think they'll cost, Lincoln? <laughs> They're 20 bucks at least, you know. We'll be out hawking them. Yeah, 30 bucks right here. So this is what happens. So not only do you have people now who have the sores all over their body, but then you have the stench from the sea life. Then now also you have uh, fresh water, the fresh springs that have also turned to blood. Uh, the fourth bowl is poured out. You remember this time it's poured out on the sun. And this time, instead of the rheostat being turned down as it was in one of the trumpet judgments, it is turned up and it's it says here in chapter 16 that people will be severely burned as a result of the heat that is coming from the sun, perhaps uh, the ozone layer that protects uh, the earth from the harmful rays of the sun will somehow be removed or destroyed, perhaps as a result of nuclear warfare. We don't know. We just know that it is going to happen. And so you have all of these things that are happening, one heaped upon another. And, and so the fifth angel pours out his his bowl, well, this time on the Euphrates River, which is the dividing line really between Israel and all of her enemies. And the Euphrates River is dried up, chapter 16 says, to make way for the armies of the east who will be making their way toward Israel for that final battle, which is the battle of what? is the battle of Armageddon. And so God is preparing the way here. The Euphrates River now is dried up. And then when the, the seventh bowl is poured out, this time it is poured out into the air. And we know that Satan is the prince and power of the air. And so perhaps this is uh, being poured out against Satan and his kingdom. And there is, a, uh, there is thunder and lightning and a severe earthquake unlike the earth has ever experienced before. And the mountains will be leveled and the islands will disappear. And, and hailstones up to 100 pounds uh, will fall from the sky and many, uh, many in Antichrist's kingdom will be killed as a result of that. And so if you can imagine yourself, and this is how we closed last week, if you can imagine yourself as a believer living during this time. Now, the sores haven't affected you, but we're not told whether these other judgments affect the believers or not. I mean, the sun, the scorching heat, uh, the lack of water, the stench from sea life, I'm sure this is affects everyone. And so as a believer, if you can imagine what the believing church at this time is, is going through. And so chapter 16 then gives us a synopsis of the wrath of God, uh, especially on the military as they make their way uh, west toward the nation of, of Israel. And so in chapters 17 and 18, uh, they don't give us any more chronological detail, but what they do is they begin to fill in the blanks of what has already been given to us now in chapter 16. These last three and a half years, the ultimate goal is the, the destruction of the Antichrist and all of his kingdom. We've already seen in 16 where militarily he's toast. 
He is, because we know what happens in chapter 19. Jesus comes, and with a word, uh, the armies of the Antichrist are destroyed. That we know. But what happens to the rest of Babylon? And so uh, chapter 17, we're going to see religious Babylon that is going to be destroyed. And then chapter 18, then we'll fill in the blanks as far as the government of the Antichrist being destroyed. And so John is being given a lot of details here. And he's been being given it in a lot of imagery. And so, again, we have to take our time as we go through it. And we have to read other passages of Scripture, perhaps in Revelation or perhaps in some of the prophetic uh, writings in the Old Testament to kind of give us a clearer picture of what is going on here. Now, is everyone okay? Anyone confused yet? (laughs) It is difficult. It is a revelation, and I'll tell you what, every time I read it, every time I do this study, I, I begin to adjust my thinking. Bottom line is Jesus wins. I know that. But all of the details in between, uh, we pretty much know the timing, the detail of the timing, but every time I read something, I think, you know what, it could also mean that. It doesn't change the goal. It doesn't change the timing, but the details of it kind of change in my mind. And so I'm going to teach you as I, as I believe it to be today. <laughs> okay. We may come back in three weeks after Easter and say, you know what? I've had a change of heart on this particular passage of Scripture. Um, but anyway, are you ready? Chapter 17? Okay, here we go. Verse 1. Then, let's stop. No, it's just kidding. <laughs> then... One of the seven angels, you remember this is the seven angels that poured out the bowls on the earth. Now, all of them now have appeared before the throne. Uh, Now, we don't know if this is after they have poured them or if this is before they even received the bowls because remember, we're going back and we're filling in the details of the destruction of Babylon, which is the kingdom of the Antichrist, okay? So this is what happens. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me. Now let's stop right there. What would you do? One of the angels came and spoke to me. I mean, it doesn't say here that John was frightened, you know, but he has seen so many events up to this point. Uh, The seal judgments and the trumpet judgments, he's been before the throne and he has seen the Lamb of God and all of a sudden this powerful angel appears before him and tells John this, come and I will show you the judgment of the notorious prostitute or great whore, or harlot, your version may read, who is seated on or by many waters. Okay, so who is this prostitute? This is the first question that we have to answer. And the answer is simply, and we're going to see that as we move on, that this is the false religious that is being propagated by the Antichrist. You see, the Antichrist will use religion, especially during that first three and a half year, to garner people to follow him. And what more powerful tool to do that than religion? Now understand this, the church is already gone, right? The church is already gone, and so what kind of religion is this? It's a false religion. It's a religion made up, and we're going to see what type it is, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a key that the Antichrist will use uh, to attract people's attention to garner their fellowship to him at this point during the first three and a half years. And so this kind of covers seven years. It goes back and follows religious Babylon to its destruction. And so this is what happens here in chapter 17. Four times in this particular chapter, the woman is called a harlot or a prostitute, and her sin is called fornication. Her evil influence has extended to the whole world reaching even into high places, the kings uh, of the earth. And so many times in the Bible, uh, 
uh, prostitution or, or the being a prostitute re- is a reference to false religion or to false gods or to idolatry so many times. Uh, you remember this is the mistake that Israel uh, made as they crossed into the promised land. God told Joshua, when you go into the promised land, you to, are to destroy every living thing that is there. Why? Because their sins had reached its limit and God said they needed to be destroyed. Because if you don't, if you allow yourself then to allow those people to live, then there will be a tendency to do what? There will be a tendency to follow their evil practices, and it became known as Israel has prostituted themselves to the nations around them. And so many times we say, read the book of Judges, and it's just this up and down experience where Israel would prostitute themselves uh, with the religion of the people that they did not destroy when they went in, and then God would raise up a judge and deliver them, and, and then finally living in peace, and all of a sudden they veer off again, and they begin to prostitute themselves. And the book of Judges is this roller coaster experience of God's blessing and the consequences of falling into idolatry. And so the prostitute here, if you have a pencil, just put uh, Antichrist's false religion. That's what that stands for uh, right here. And it says that she sits on or besides many waters. Now, does that mean she's actually standing by the water? No. If we go to verse 15, uh, it says that the waters stand for many nations or many peoples. And so what it means here that many nations, if not all nations, will indulge themselves or prostitute themselves with this false religion then that is being offered then by the Antichrist. Why? So that he can garner their attention because he wants the whole world to follow him. He will have all the answers. He will have all the answers to the great disappearance that happened as a result of the rapture of the church. Uh, Perhaps he will be meeting the needs of people as they follow him. And so it will be a social religion. It will be uh, a religion uh, uh, that is minus God is what it is. And so it, begin, it, be, it becomes a religion of, of man. Uh, verse 2 says uh, that the kings of the earth committed sexual immorality with her, and those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. Uh, many of the practices of the pagan nations in which Israel was told to destroy included sexual immorality. In fact, when Paul would go into a town, as they say, Ephesus or Corinth, there would be a temple that would be dedicated to some god, and included in that temple would be male and female prostitutes as as part of their practice of, of religions. And so the imagery here is all of the world leaders then will indulge her or will follow uh, this false religion. Why? So that they can gain favor with the Antichrist and because it's attractive, right? And because it's attractive. And as a result of that, many people uh, will follow this false religion as well. Why? Because, hey, if the leaders are doing it, it must be okay. And so we have the great kings of the world who will commit adultery with her. It says the inhabitants or those who live on the earth became drunk on the wine of her sexual immorality. And so perhaps a part of the worship in this false religion during this seven-year period will include uh, sexual immorality as well. And it will be very, very... Listen, to the unspiritual eye... Uh, when there is so much destruction going on on the earth, this will seem like a reprieve and, and, and attractant for them. And so the great leaders of the world will follow uh, this false religion. The inhabitants of the earth will also uh, follow. And so millions of individuals would be swept up into uh, this uh, false religious uh, organization that is growing by the tens of millions. The whole world will worship her. Now we know that somewhere at the three and a half year point, that's going to change, right? Because no longer will it be the worship of this false religion, but it will be the worship of the Antichrist, the image then that is set up in the temple. But the Antichrist will use religion 
to garner as much attention as he can uh, to himself. Uh, and so there is a call even today, is there not, for one world religion? Uh, I've talked to many people who says, well, you know what, that's good for you, but it doesn't matter uh, what religion you are, we all worship the same God. How many of you have heard that before? Uh, we don't, do we? We don't. We don't serve some impersonal God that is some life force floating around in the universe somewhere. We worship a, a God who is personal. We worship a God who loves us, uh, who is very concerned about having an intimate relationship with each and every one of us. And so, no, it's not the same God, but it, it can be very, very, very attractive. And so this is what's happening here. There's a call for today. We've got the World Council of Churches um, uh, I'm my own God. I can be, God can be whatever I want him or her or it uh, to be. Uh, and we even see today our Bibles are changing. Uh, they're changing the genders uh, and to uh, neutral genders in the Bible. And so all of this is happening uh, very subtly, and it's creeping into our churches. And so many of the false religions today are growing by leaps and bounds. Why? Because it's made to look attractive. And the churches like ours that stand for the truth, uh, we see that are falling by the wayside. And you see very, very little encouragement of the church, the true church of Jesus Christ in our media today. How many of you have seen a positive comment about the true church today on any of our media? Not at all. Uh, it's being denigrated. In fact, when the rapture happens, I believe the Antichrist comes forward and will blame all the troubles of the world on those who have disappeared. Now that they're gone, we can finally have peace. And so uh, the, the Antichrist will have secured peace, and he will have secured economic recovery. Now, during this first three and a half years, he will provide aid to those who are in uh, facing hardships as a result of the disasters, but in return, they will have to follow him, right? And, uh, and so he will use this false religious system uh, to bring unity uh, of the world to the world. And, uh, and so what will be their God? What do you think their God will be? Yeah. Wealth, materialism, all things that are attractive to the eye. Remember, they only have seven years right here. So we got to get it as, as much as we can. Uh, Paul told Timothy this, in later times, some will abandon their faith and will follow seducing spirits and things that are taught by demons. And so again, all of this is Satan controlled, right? Because it's anti-God. That's why he's called the anti Christ, because everything is totally against uh, Jesus Christ. Paul says that they'll have a form of godliness. In other words, the ritual and the ceremony will be there, but they will deny its power. Why? What gives its power? What gives its power is the Holy Spirit. What gives its power is the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the reason why we have power today. It's because he's alive. He's not a, a God. He's not a grave. There's not a grave there in which Jesus' body is still there. He's out of there. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and I believe he's getting ready very, very, very soon to come back. But first, he's going to take us to be in heaven with him. The rapture, the sound of that trumpet, the shout of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ are going to rise, and we who are alive, maybe during this church service. Can you imagine? If that happens here, David, can you finish out the service before us? <laughs> <No, just, laughs> yeah, if you're here, that's right. None of us will be here, right? If you know Jesus Christ, none of us will be here. This will be just an empty building. I was going to leave my Bible right here and the notes right here because we'll be in heaven. And so this is what happens here. And so the scene here, and I told you this chapter was going to take a little bit. The scene here then opens really kind of an, it's an invitation uh, for John to see what God is going to do with this worldwide religious system. Now, we've already seen what God is going to do at the end of the seven years. Now we're going back and seeing how the details of the destruction of the religious system. Chapter 18 then will give us the details of the destruction of the government of the Antichrist. And so this is what is happening here. Yeah, gosh, and we've got five minutes. Hmm. All right, questions. I'm not going to go any further. 
I got to mark my. We're not going to get back here to. How many of you want to go further? How many of you have to get home? Listen, Karen is fixing an awesome lunch. If we're going to. Let's take another verse. Okay, let's, here we go. Verse three. I'm excited about this. I really am. And then the angel carries me away, this is John, in the spirit to a wilderness. Now, a wilderness is some place that is desolate, uh, that's not inhabited. It's not a place that we want to be. You remember Israel when they were in the wilderness. They did not choose to be there, but they were there as a result of unbelief and rebellion. And so John now is taken by the spirit into a wilderness. You You remember now, John is in his 90s here. You know, if he's, if he's seeing all of this as a young man, that's one thing. But he is seeing all of this now as a man who's mature in his years. <laughs> and so you can imagine the emotions that he's going through. And so the Spirit takes him away, and she sees, now he sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Now this woman, if you're writing in your Bible, this woman is the prostitute, okay? This is the false religious system. We've already covered that, right? And so I saw a woman or this false religious system sitting on a scarlet beast. Who do we know the beast to be? The Antichrist, right? The Antichrist and his kingdom. So if you have a pencil, put next to that scarlet beast, the Antichrist and his kingdom, okay? This is what's being talked about, the the beast, that was covered with blasphemous names. And so this is not a godly creature, right? So this is a godless creature covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. Can you imagine seeing that? And John is writing this out. They're never going to believe this as he's he's writing on all of this down. And so John is being given a description then of the false religious system, but also the kingdom then that is going to take this false religion as theirs, okay? We've already talked about that. The Antichrist will use this system. Well, the Antichrist and his kingdom. And so we're given a picture then of, of, um, of the Antichrist's kingdom, and he's pictured then as a scarlet beast. Uh, the woman is sitting on him, which means she has rested there. The two now have become one, right? And uh, Interesting that the Old Testament says, you know, talking about scarlet, scarlet is associated with sin, with a Satan. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And so here is this sinful, false religion now that has been adopted by the scarlet beast or the kingdom then of the Antichrist. And this is what, this is what John, this, now that all of this is being built up. Now, as it develops during the seven-year period, because remember, we're going back and reviewing, we're seeing the development of this religious system, how it turns three and a half years into it, and the result of this system at the end of the seven years. And we're only going to get through... um, Anyway, we'll finish this verse and then we'll close. Um, And this, the beast... The kingdom is covered with blasphemous names. We've seen already that as judgment happens on Antichrist's kingdom, there are those who shake their fists at God and curse his name uh, uh, because of all that they are going through. And so uh, these are the governments, these are those leaders, these are those nations then that have rebelled against the truth of the 144,000 witnesses, the truth of the two witnesses, the truth of that miraculous angel angel that was presenting to the world uh, the eternal gospel. And so they've rebelled against that. And so uh, they have, if you rebel against that, if you rebel against Jesus Christ, then the only thing left is what? The world and whatever the world has to offer you. And so this is what's being shown here. And the beast is being described as having said seven heads and ten horns. Uh, many people believe uh, these to be leaders or nations. There are those who believe uh, that the seven here refers to the seven hills. We know that Rome is the city on seven hills. There are many who believe that perhaps uh, the seat of the Antichrist will not be in Babylon because there is no Babylon, but that it will be in Rome itself. A lot of scripture to back that up. This is unsaved Rome, right? I have some believers, 
friends that are Catholics, all right? So we're not pointing out the Catholic religion. We're pointing out ecclesiastical Rome, uh, the leadership and, and what it stands for here. And so the seven heads, perhaps Rome, uh, the ten horns are ten powerful leaders or ten nations, uh, political alliances, uh, so to speak, an axis of evil, if you will, uh, who have taken on and adopted this false religious system. And if you're a believer during that time, obviously you are in the minority because we've seen and we've studied up to this point that as a person Person, you will make one of two choices. Either I will follow Jesus Christ or I will follow the Antichrist. And I will make that choice. I will make that decision. And so I think, I think we're going to stop there. Darn it. But um, anyway, so we'll stop with uh, verse 3. Next week, we'll be uh, talking about the events of Palm Sunday. Uh, if you want to go further, feel free to pick up your Bible and study further. It's an awesome chapter uh, here. But next Sunday, we'll be talking about uh, the Palm Sunday, the events there. And of course, the Sunday after that, we'll be celebrating the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. And so that's where we are. It's exciting, isn't it? It's exciting times that we live in. And I thank God that He's given us hope. And I think about during these, these times, this, during this seven-year period, uh, it's going to take great faith to trust in Jesus Christ. Because when I do that, in many cases, I'll be signing my death warrant. Just as I will be hunted down. And so your faith better be strong. I think about the culture in which we live. Some people say, you know, we live in tough times. No, we don't. You know, nobody will stop me from going out in the, uh, the street, Main Street in Bedford and open up my Bible and, and reading Scripture. Nobody's going to hunt me down and shoot me. I don't think they will. You know, we have that freedom. Try doing that in Saudi Arabia. Try doing that in Kiev. You'll be hunted down. And so we have it easy, do we not? And so our faith, I think your faith grows stronger when you're going through difficult times. How many of you have gone through difficulties? When you go through difficulties, one of two things can happen. Either I will be drawn closer to God, or I will allow myself to fall away from God. I say, you know what? I choose God. It's not easy, is it? But my faith is strengthened when that. That's why Paul and the apostles said, you know what? We count it a time to rejoice when we suffer for our faith. How can you rejoice? Paul, uh, James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Yeah, right. But it's not until you go through those trials that you experience, what I call it, a, 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 a deeper level of faith. Do you know what I'm talking about? That I would never have experienced if I hadn't gone through that. And so my faith is strengthened. And so this last song we're going to sing, what is it, the last song? It's something to do with faith. Faith is the victory. Faith. I mean, remember this hymn. It's been a long time since I sang this one. Faith is the victory. And we have no keyboard. In fact, pray for Tammy and Bill. Uh, Bill, you know, suffered a setback. He had a bowel blockage, very, very serious surgery, and, uh, has, and will be in ICU for about 10 days. I talked to Tammy this morning, and, and we've all been praying for Bill. And she said, the doctors cannot believe it. The doctors cannot believe how quickly he is recovering. And I thought to myself, I can believe it. <laughs> Why? Because there have been so many people praying for him. And so we've missed our piano playing and his guitar playing this morning, but he's in good hands, right? And so their faith will be strengthened through this. And so um, let's sing together. We're going to do an acapulco. I'm just going to, hopefully I'll get the note right. <laughs> hopefully I'll start it <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, why don't we all stand and sing this? Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know.
that overcomes the world. Sing it now. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen? Even our faith. You know, God gives us grace. He offers us a free gift, but we have to accept it by faith, right? And so... Thank God for faith. Thank you for His grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord, so much for uh, Your love to us. Father, I thank You, Lord, that our future is secure because You offered the grace that comes from a risen Savior, Jesus Christ, and we have in turn accepted it by faith. Lord, thank You so much for that. Thank You for the hope that we have in You. Lord, I pray that this week, Father, that we will take that hope with us. Lord, and share it with family. Lord, share it with neighbors. Lord, the people who we go to work with or school with. Uh, everyone that we see, Father, that faith is real. But it can only be real, Father, in Jesus Christ. In your precious name that we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.